Hi everyone, it's Mrs. Meehan, and in this screencast, I'm going to introduce our next unit, which is energy. And I'm going to start out by talking a little bit about conservation principles and systems. So one of the most powerful concepts in science are called conservation principles. So these principles allow us to solve problems without worrying too much about the details of a process. We just have to take a snapshot of a system initially and finally. By comparing these two snapshots, we can learn a lot. And this is something we've done in problem solving, initial velocity, final velocity, initial displacement, displacement, final displacement. You know, we're, we're all looking at that from the pers perspective of focusing on a system. So as an example, let's take a look at a bag of candy. So if you know that there are 50 pieces of candy at the beginning, and you know that none of the pieces have been taken out or added, you know that there must be 50 pieces at the end. You can change the way you arrange them by moving them around, but you still will have 50 pieces. In that case, we would say that the number of pieces of candy is conserved. That is, we should always get the same amount, regardless of how they are arranged. We also have to be clear about the system that we're talking about. If we're talking about a specific type of candy, we can't suddenly start talking about a different one and expect to get the same answers. So you have to define the system whenever we use a conservation principle. But what exactly is a system and how does it help us solve physics problems? So let's discuss these two questions before we get back to conservation principles. We'll start with why can we even solve physics problems? So we've learned about forces and we've learned how to solve physics problems. But have you ever wondered how we can actually solve them? After all, every object we study is in some way affected by a lot of other objects. In fact, you could say that any object is affected by everything in the universe. For example, we know that the moon exerts a gravitational force on the Earth. So it must exert a force on every object on Earth. Why then, when we work out the motion of a dropped ball near the surface of the Earth, don't we take into account the effect of the moon's gravity, or for that matter, the gravitational force from the sun and all the other planets, and we can keep going. When we saw for the motion of a dropped ball, we only consider the gravitational pull of the Earth because the Earth's gravitational force on the ball is so much bigger than the gravitational force of the moon and everything else on the ball that we can essentially ignore everything. They're neglig negligible. So we can ignore everything but the ball and the earth when solving the problem. So even though every object in the universe can affect every other object in the universe, most of the effects on any one object are too tiny to care about. Often we can just consider one or a small amount of objects and ignore everything else. To solve problems, we divide the universe into what we want to look at and everything else. The little piece of the universe that we look at when we solve a specific problem is called the system. A system may consist of one or more objects or an amount of material in a region of space. We put an ima imaginary boundary or picture frame around the system. Everything else, somewhere all of the universe outside the system boundary is called the environment. When a system is unaffected by anything in the environment, we call it a closed system. It's as if the system was in a universe by itself. The objects can't leave, no other object can get in, and no outside forces affect anything in the system. When a system can be affected by the environment, we call it an open system. While we are focused on the objects in the system, they are affected by the environment. Objects might be able to leave, other objects might get in, and some outside forces affect the objects in the system. By separating the system from the environment, we can make a problem solvable. By defining an appropriate system, we can isolate the forces that are within the system from the forces that act on the system from the environment. If the system is open, external forces can do work on the system. 
And this is something that we'll be examining in more detail in this unit. So as an example, work would not equal zero. And in this equation here, we have an initial energy plus work equals the final energy. In this case, the energy of the system will change. It is an open system in this case. On the other hand, if the system is closed, there is no work done on the system by outside forces. So work would equal zero. Taking a look, that would mean that the initial energy in the system would be equal to the final energy. Therefore, the energy of the system doesn't change. This is called conservation of energy. Now, what exactly is work and how does it relate to changes in energy? We'll be answering that later on. Let's try a couple practice problems for the information you just heard. A system is defined as the correct answer is B, the part of the universe that contains the objects we are interested in. The environment is defined as The answer is D, the part of the universe that does not contain the objects we are interested in. A closed system B is unaffected by the external forces. <clears throat> 